Um, just in the interest of time, while my slideshow is coming up, I'll just get started. Um, yeah, my name's Alistair Reid. I come from Melbourne Polytechnic in Melbourne, Victoria, Australia. Um, I used to be a geneticist with an uh, interest in wine. Uh, and now I'm a uh, winemaker with an interest in genetics. And what I've tried to do um, with this very early stages project is um, combine the two uh, interests. Yeah, it was on the... Um, there's a memory stick. Because I feel uh, genetics is a great mechanism for conceptualising the decision-making process. When it comes to working out why a consumer decides to buy a particular wine or doesn't decide to buy a particular wine. Um, it came to us, uh, this project, because um, you, you, once upon a time you used to, to work out the genetic mechanism behind a trait, you used to sequence um, particular genes, you used to um, have to decide which gene to analyse, um, a, best, a best guess uh, situation. I used to sequence it and then you'd, you'd look for differences in the genes between strategically selected uh, subjects um, because the process was extremely expensive. Whereas nowadays you just sequence massive amounts of the population and then make links, links between traits in the, in the individuals within that population. The expenses come down drastically and I think um, analysing the decision making process or consumer preference is the same. Um, we can get access to huge banks of transactional data uh, and use that to get the, the population to tell us uh, what wines they like and, and what aspects of wine they like, um, rather than trying to reverse engineer that process using a, a bottom-up approach. Um, so uh, what I've got here is, again, just some uh, early number crunching. Now, I said I was used to be a geneticist and now I'm a winemaker. I'm not a data an uh, analyst. Um, but what I thought was I'd just present such bad data analysis today that people would want to collaborate with me afterwards just out of respect for their, their field. So I apologise for my, my statistics a little bit later on. Uh, so what I... Um, if, uh, what I got here? Um, so I'll just give you a little background on the Australian wine sector and why it's a good model for a uh, project like this. Um, the data that we have access to, um, how we've used it, uh, linking temperature to uh, consumer decision making, um, demographics or geography uh, to consumer preference as well. And I think there's some um, nice interesting results that have fallen out uh, already and then at the end just some recommendations for further research. Um, so the Australian wine retail sector is an interesting one. It's made up of two really big players, uh, Wes Farmers and Woolworths, which occupy almost 60% of um, the wine retail market. So 60% of the wine sold in Australia is sold through these two, two shops. Um, and they account for about $6 billion worth of um, beverage sales uh, each year, uh, with wine um, pretty much the dominant alcoholic beverage in Australia, um, which is a great opportunity. Um, it's not so great for independent retailers, but it's fantastic for um, winemakers slash geneticists and amateur data analysis and analysts because you can get access to huge banks of data from just a couple of sources. So you don't have to go a long way to find access to this data. Um, so what affects uh, consumer preference for a particular product? Um, well, there's, uh, without going into, say, the, the actual genetic preference, which is actually in their DNA for a particular wine, the epigenetic, so the actual environmental and developmental factors which influence what wine they decide to buy. Uh, there's visual cues, label, the position on the shelf, the status symbol of the particular wine. The history of the actual individual, so a regional bias towards their purchases and a personal bias as well, um, as well as environmental factors. And this was the origins of the project, looking at the environmental factors which influence a particular purchase, climatic effects and uh, light levels in a shop. Um, one way I like to think about it, maybe it's because um, from the background I have, is, is to think about decision making as, as particular uh, genes. So everybody has, um, well let's say there's a gene for each particular decision. So there's a gene for buying Shiraz, which encodes for the decision for buying Shiraz. There's a gene which encodes for the decision to buy a Sauvignon Blanc. And under a particular, if you have 
this gene under particular environmental circumstances, that gene will be activated and you'll have that decision. You'll make that decision to buy that particular wine. Whereas some people don't have, um, don't have the fully functioning gene, so they wouldn't buy that um, variety under any circumstances. Um, so these decision genes, thinking of the decisions in this way, are influenced developmentally, so the background of the individual and environmentally, um, the environment that they're exposed to at the time of sale. Uh, if we look at this in practice, this is the sales, all the online sales of champagne in the city of Melbourne in Australia uh, in 2013. And you can see there's a fair amount of volatility in um, these sales. So this is January up here and this is December. Um, we get a lot of up and down, that's the volatility. Um, if you average it out, uh, that red line's just dropped a little bit, but you can see there's summer, this is summer in Australia at the end of the year. Um, uh, you can see that champagne sales are higher in the summer months and lower in the winter months, but again there's a lot of volatility around that. So that's the environmental factor influencing uh, champagne sales. And then how do we account for these spikes? Well, interestingly, these spikes account absolutely perfectly to key moments in the Melbourne calendar. Um, we have people celebrating Easter with champagne, which I thought you had chocolate, but I'm happy with champagne then. Mother's Day gets jumps out. One week after the end of the financial year, there's a spike in champagne sales, which I can only put down to everyone finding out how much their tax return is. Um, Sports are religion in Australia, so football finals, that's each weekend of September, which there's a final on each weekend of September, so you get a spike then. And then the only, there's only one thing Australians like more than sport, and that's gambling. And the Melbourne Cup horse race is in the first weekend of November, and there it is. There is another spike in champagne. And then New Year's Eve, it just goes absolutely off the charts. So here, just crudely looking at um, champagne sales alone, we can look at the developmental and environmental cues in a consumer's um, decision-making process. Um, so uh, can we quantify to what degree wine purchase decisions are influenced by weather? And can we actually look on a city level um, wine preference? So across a single city, can we divide the city up into the wines that they prefer? Um, so very quickly, here's Australia. And the state I'm talking about down the bottom here is Victoria. Uh, Victoria and South Australia, two of the larger wine-producing states in Australia, as well as Western Australia, Tassie and New South Wales. Um, this is Victoria itself. It's an interesting state. It's got desert in it. It's got alpine areas. And uh, along the coast, it's got a temperate climate. Most of the grape production is, uh, the fine wine production is down here. And the bulk wine is produced up in the northwest. Um, so that's just a little bit about Victoria. Um, so what I did was I got... Um, a bit over 4 million um, transactions from one of the large retail chains in Victoria. Um, and they were converted into relative numbers. So what was the relative amount of sh uh, Shiraz bought each day? Uh, how much Chardonnay? Uh, plugged that into R with one of my collaborators. Um, just to see um, maybe a series of buying consumer mentalities in the state of Victoria. What, what was bought with what and what, what what was, um, what cannibalised the sales of another variety. Um, and it was uh, quite interesting, Sauvignon Blanc's out by itself. So when people are buying Sauvignon Blanc, they're not buying anything else. Um, the white wines, unsurprisingly, uh, sorry, these are the, the top eight selling varieties in Victoria. Uh, all the white varieties co-locate, but also with Pinot Noir. So Pinot Noir is actually bought essentially as a white variety, um, really. Which is interesting from a, a bottle shop perspective or a retail outlet perspective when it's normally stocked in the red wine section where it's actually bought as a white wine. Um, and then Shiraz, Cabernet, Sauvignon and Merlot um, are out on their own as well. And Shiraz is bought in opposition to Sauvignon Blanc. And temperature was put into this uh, modelling as well, but I'll get a bit more onto that uh, a bit later on. So let's look at temperature and isolation. Um, if you just look at the average sales of Shiraz and Sav Blanc in each individual state in Australia, so there's about eight states in Australia. Well, it's not about, there is. Um, the average price, uh, sorry, the average temperature in each state um, is quite well correlated to Shiraz and Sav Blanc sales. So the warmer the, the average temperature in a state, the more Sauvignon Blanc they buy, and the cooler the state, the more Shiraz they buy. 
Um, so there's nothing like um, proving something that everybody already knew. Um, but I thought I'd do that anyway. And then, so that's on, an on a nationwide level. Then we can actually look that on a store by store or a state level as well. This is an individual store um, in the city of Melbourne. And this is every Shiraz sale. Um, um, it doesn't look like a lot of dots, but there's a, there's a heap of dots in there. And again, the temperature on the day uh, affects uh, Shiraz sales, uh, which is sort of interesting on a number of levels, especially uh, from the previous talk. We, we often talk about how climate change will affect what grapes you can grow and it will affect viticulture, but maybe it will also affect um, what wines will be purchased as well. And there's Sauvignon Blanc going in the opposite direction. Um, interestingly, if you look at Google Trends as well, people Google the word Shiraz more when it's colder, and they Google the word Sav Blanc more when it's warmer. Um, I'm not sure if that's um, proving the other correlation or not, but it's interesting that they're, they're aligned like that. Um, looked at what, how many stores actually had a strong correlation with temperature. So did, did all stores, say, all stores show this uh, increase in Shiraz sales with decreasing temperature, and in, uh, sorry, decreasing Shiraz sales with increasing temperature. Um, um, well, a lot of stores did, and actually it was the stores from the wealthier suburbs which bought uh, in correlation with temperature. So the, the wealthier suburbs, their sales were dictated by temperature, whereas in the, the traditionally poorer demographic um, suburbs, um, that correlation fell over. Um, and talking to the store managers, that was generally because at higher temperatures, those stores, um, people substituted a wine purchase for beer or pre-mixed drinks. Um, so geography, I'll just uh, skip over that. What I did was plugged uh, all those transactions into a bit of genetic software, which normally is used to look at the evolutionary relationship of organisms. Um, you might have seen these evolutionary trees before. So what I did was just throw all these transactions into this genetic software which had no idea what the um, city of Melbourne looked like. And what it actually did was found that all the suburbs in the same parts of town aligned with each other. So these red ones, green and orange, are all in the same different parts of Melbourne. And these blue ones here are all country stores uh, in the rural areas. So the different parts of Melbourne on a, on a city level actually buy uh, the same. Um, this is the city of Melbourne broken up into the individual districts. Um, uh, so each little block is a particular district. The more red is the more sales. Um, so actually, this is Chardonnay sales across the city of Melbourne, and it breaks down the cliche that it's, uh, you know, the Chardonnay set, that, um, that the posher people drink Chardonnay. Well, in the west, of this, that's the centre of Melbourne. Uh, this is traditionally the more working class part of Melbourne and they actually buy substantially more Chardonnay than the, um, the more well-to-do areas in the east. Um, Riesling, interestingly, follows this uh, southeast to northwest corridor. Again, that's the centre of Melbourne, and I was thinking to myself, what does that align with? That's a very strange distribution, uh, that corridor there. What actually aligns here, it's hard to see, but that's, that red line there represents the commute, a 30-minute commute into town, uh, which, which is the the most expensive houses in Melbourne. So that aligns with the purchase of Riesling. And just the last one here, Sav Blanc, all is on the outer um, fringe uh, of Melbourne. Uh, what that says is uh, up, up to you. Um, so in summary, um, with this large data set, we can get some really interesting correlations out of it. And I'm really interested in uh, collaborating um, with anyone who'd like to be involved, because I think there's a, a lot of possibilities. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.